Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode 45 of Teaching Tales, the podcast totally devoted to sharing stories from the world of education. As always, I am Brent Coley, your host and elementary principal in beautiful Southern California, former fourth and fifth grade teacher. Joining me today, or tonight, because I'm recording at night, is the one, the only, Ryan O'Donnell. Ryan, how are you? Hey, Brent. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Super excited that uh, we reached out and I get this opportunity to be able to have uh, to, to chat with you. Well, uh, I appreciate appreciate you coming on. And I have uh, you, you are a fellow podcaster. So before we kind of mm-hmm. go into how how we coordinated this this conversation for anyone not familiar with creative ed tech, who <laughs> is Ryan O'Donnell? Uh, OK, so, uh, yeah, the, the quick pitch is I'm a, I'm a teacher. Uh, I have recently gone back into the classroom. I was a TOSA and I'm still kind of doing a little bit of a TOSA work and I'm in uh, out, a suburb outside Sacramento. Uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years, formerly a social studies teacher. And like I said, I did a TOSA for two years. This third year of my TOSA gig, I tried to split and be uh, go back to the classroom doing video production at uh, the school that I taught at before called Rockland High School. And uh, um, juggling the two hats has is, is been a lot. Next year, I'm going back full time. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I love, I think more than, uh, I, I do love teaching. Uh, I'm going back because I love working with kids. Uh, but I also have a huge passion about um, uh, the, 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 for the folks who are listening, you, because it's this greater connected community. And I, you know, I felt like it's been the number one thing that has driven me to um, be better and to, it's, it's the group of people that I found and I connected with. And so I, I love the idea about giving back. And so everything from being on social media and doing a podcast called Check This Out and another one called Talking Social Studies and just being in the community is kind of, a, um, is, is, I guess that's my gig. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and gosh, I I feel like I say this on every episode. Anytime somebody brings this up, it, it's just so true. The fact that you and I are chatting, mm-hmm. we're both, in, <clears throat> both in California, but you're in the, Northern California, I'm in Southern California. Yet mm-hmm. we're going to be learning from each other, and through the magic of technology, we're going to put this out, and hopefully, other people will learn from exactly. it. Exactly, so. and we all are connected, and it's amazing. I I, I teach at a large staff, and I have more connections with Brent and other and these other people on a daily, daily, weekly, you know, uh, on a regular basis. And we share and we learn and we get inspired. And it feels like, man, it's like I, sometimes, you know, there's people that I work with all the time, but it's, it's some of these people who haven't drank that Kool-Aid and have got, and, and find their connections. And so, yeah, yeah, no, and I, we just had a staff meeting last week and I once again kind of plugged it and just, just told my staff, ladies and gentlemen, I have learned more from mm-hmm. people like you, Ryan and, and, and Brian and, and, yeah. And Pony Vincent and all these kind of people than I have in 22 years of organized PD. Yeah, I use this several times. <laughs> Don't take it the wrong way, but it's, we, we say it's like rehab. And I've not been through rehab, but from what I've heard in reality shows, rehab takes several times. And so oftentimes people will need to go through the process. Like I, you'll often hear like, I started Twitter and I didn't do much with it. I'm like, try it a third time, try it a fourth time. When you get it after a couple times, you, you, once you get that aha moment, when, and that could be anything from I listened to a podcast, I read a blog post from Jennifer Gonzalez, I went to a conference, I saw something. Sooner or later, something's going to stick and and, and uh, you'll be on your path. No, a- absolutely. And for anyone listening, mom, dad, <laughs> Sean Wisely, Corey Orlando, the few people that I know that are listening. <laughs> I mean, for anyone who, who has not listened to Ryan's podcast, who does it with Brian Briggs called Check This Out. Check this it, out. It, check this out, powered by Q. <laughs> so you got to subscribe. It, it is fantastic. They they share, I mean, they have guests on sometimes. They share uh, things from the ed tech world, ways to get better. Um, it's and, and it's just, it's engaging. So it is. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And and shout out to uh, my dear friend Briggs. Brian and I, we, we, we try to do a lighthearted look and we try to, uh, we have fun when we're together when we go to conferences and we and, and we love the podcast venue because it, it's an opportunity for us to keep that sort of um, uh, that frivolity kind of going. Yeah. And and you you accomplished that uh, big time. So well, thanks. But uh, <clears throat> the reason that that we're talking right now, I mean, I wanted to to have you on the show for a while. But last night, actually, I was listening to episode 82 of Check mm-hmm. And you teased toward the end of that episode a story from your past, uh, your past, that makes it sound negative, <laughs> from uh, your younger years when you were um, 
in college playing football and you were talking about grit and and just hearing your little like the abstract version of it the cliff notes version of it i was so intrigued that i as soon as i finished your podcast i got on voxer i said ryan you got to come on the show you got to finish that story you got to tell me about grit because i think right now perseverance uh growth mindset is such um i hate to say buzzword because that minimizes it's hot though right now it's hot it is that, yeah. that, I just don't want to minimize the impact oh, for sure. Yeah. But, but yeah, the buzzword makes you feel like there's a, uh, something minimal, but there's things that, that, that resonate with people and stay. Yeah. And I think that this is, this is something. Yeah. So, so will you share kind of what, what you started or you shared a little bit in your podcast there about your, your football days in college and you, you had oh, the grit. Yeah, for sure. First off, Hey, uh, and, and, like what Brent just did, I just want to, uh, like we're saying about staying connected, uh, we know each other. And so Brent felt like I'm going to hop on Voxer and contact him because he got a little bit of a something he wanted to follow up with. And I would say any of you, if you're reading a, if you're reading a blog post or you're listening to a podcast and you don't know that person, trust me, that person is putting it out there for a reason because they want to help people. And most of the, most of us are doing it for nothing. And so if you give a little shout out back and just say, thanks, that will you know, my wife uses the, the term all the time about filling people's buckets and that'll help fill that, fill that people's bucket, fill that bucket. And if it could be somebody huge, it could be a Tony Vincent or Jennifer Gonzalez, but just say, love that thing. Thanks so much. And so anyway, that's my no. shout out again for staying connected. No, and, and I absolutely agree because I, I, I jokingly say mom, dad, Sean, <laughs> like nobody's, but, but even if one person is listening and they let me know, Hey, keep doing what you're doing type thing. It, mm -hmm. it makes me want to keep doing what I'm doing. So Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So yeah. So what, like you were, we were talking about grit and I've been, you know, I'm diving into the book uh, from Angela Duckworth, grit, the power of passion and perseverance. And I'm, I'm doing the audio book because I love all the things audio and uh, just resonating with me so much because I think, you know, you, you, when you, when you do these books, you feel, you know, you, you analyze yourself now, but this is one that made me really kind of think about like, not just me where I'm at right now, but also kind of like where, where I've been my path and my journey. And I want, and you question, and I'm not saying that I have grit and there's this whole grit scale that she gives you. And I'm like, you know, cause all there, it's not a black or white, it's a yes or no. And I just, you know, I try to be able to th uh, think about where I'm from. And, um, uh, and my past is I grew up in Southern California. I was about the, about of an average of a suburban kid as you can be. And, um, I found a lot of things that just sort of kind of fell into my lap because I was an extremely, um, below average student, uh, but not necessarily based on any um, failure of learning. It was literally, uh, I, I was unmotivated and uninterested. Uh, and I loved debating. I loved having conversations. And I felt like uh, I, school just it was something that did not resonate with me at all. But I felt like college was something that I was just had to do. Uh, I got poor grades in college. And um, had no intentions of playing football anywhere afterwards. And I was on a successful team and a bunch of recruiters came to look at some of the guys on the team. And next thing I know, um, recruiters were like, Hey, there's that other guy. And he's like six, four and he, you know, he runs pretty well. He's pretty skinny, but, uh, we may want to, we may be interested in him. And so I went from literally like playing one of my last couple of games to I'm getting some phone calls from some people who want to take a chance and, you know, not the biggest schools in the world. I'm talking like, this is like Fullerton and UTEP and things like that. And, uh, uh, then Reno calls University of Nevada, Reno, and they're like, I'm 17. And they would say, Hey, you want to take a trip up here? The next thing you know, I go up a trip, they give me a bunch of milkshakes and I go skiing. And I'm like, this is amazing thing. Like, I think I'm going to play football and they're whining and dining you and all this stuff. And so I'm like, that's it. I, I took a leap and we all take leaps at time. And I, I was, I was nervous. And when I got there, I, I, I crapped my pants because that whining and dining ended as soon as yeah, <laughs> real, know, I get there. Yeah, real, and I think everybody hits that, right? I mean, you right when you, your freshman year in college, it's a kick in the pants. Oh yeah, it's nothing like high school. Yeah, oh. and so here I am as a as a, a somebody who doesn't work at all in the, in the classroom and just do enough to get by, and now I'm I'm thrown into th thrown into a university here and I, I, football, and I was I was woefully uh, out of, you know, uh, underweight. And by, what I mean by that, I'm tall and skinny and they wanted me to pay, play a, a, an offensive lineman. And uh, I got to the point, I started this bad trend of, I cheated on my weight, which means like, like the heavy guys, they would shed. They tried to get, you know, they're, they're going to the bathroom as much as they can yeah. and trying to like wipe everything off. And, and the, most guys like me, like you can wear shorts and a t-shirt when you weigh. Well, I, w I was wearing like a weight belt one time, but I'm like, well, let me just leave the weight belt on. And then I started putting weights inside the weight belt. And, but once I started this process, I couldn't go back. 
So, then, otherwise, they're going to be like, the, you know, the, yeah, why the sudden weight loss? <laughs> so, uh, and, and I'm sitting there, and I was just getting beat up. I was getting beat up a lot, and I was young too. Like I was, I spent, you know, I have a November birthday, so I'm I'm there, 17 years old. You know, playing uh, football my redshirt year against guys who are 22, and you know, outweigh me by like 75 pounds, and um, and it's tough. And and, and Reno was a g- great program. I spent, you know, I played there and had a wonderful experience. But those first couple years were tough because it, it was an old school kind of program, one that were really kind of um, challenged you physically, and they wanted to push you beyond to to breaking points to point where that you starting to question who you are and what you do, and. Um, it's interesting. Have you ever had those things where, like, you look at it back then, and that was a moment, but when you were in it, it wasn't a moment. And mine was, I was going to quit, and it's halfway through the season, and you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not. This is not hyperbole. Probably fifty to seventy five percent of the kids that freshman class quit, and yeah. my roommate had quit, and I'm like, that's it. I'm, what am I doing here? I'm just going to go home to Orange County. Like this is stupid. And I said, I'm quitting. And so I'm walking back to, for, from practice, and uh, my coach had no interest in me. Never even talked to me. My my offensive line coach. And he walked past me because I'm walking slow, and he just taps me on my shoulder pads and just says, uh, "Hey, good job today, O'Donnell." And just kept walking. And I just said, I, "You know, I'm not quitting today." And that was enough. That was enough. Yeah. To in it. And that, and that didn't stay. Like I just, I felt like I, I did not have the. Uh, um, it wasn't like I, he motivated me. All. I just felt like, oh, I can't go in there today. Like he just said, good job. Like maybe give it a day or two. But that was for me, it just somewhere in the back of my head said, not today, don't quit today. Mm-hmm. And as I'm listening to this book, it just, it, it drove me to the, I feel like, yeah, like I may not have been the, the, the strongest guy. And, uh, but I saw a lot of people come and a lot of people go and some, um, and I felt like, you know what, I'm going to red shirt. I'm going to be the long snapper. I'm going to just be on punt team and kickoff return team. And next thing I know, here comes my junior year and like, hey, opportunity came. And I think that but I, that, that I just, you know, that that process, that program that broke broke a lot of us down. I came out, you know, I, I think a little bit like the Shawshank Andy Dufresne moment. I had to swim through a pile of a lot of bad stuff <laughs> a lot of bad stuff to come out smelling and feeling feeling really invigorated and i had two wonderful years my junior and senior year um you know uh, we, we had a successful team and i had some successful uh times playing and um and i felt like that had done so much for me i look where i'm at now and i don't do football at all i did football for a long time i coached for many many years and i got away from it and i feel like um yeah i, I don't want to be in that world anymore but i felt like but, but those experiences helped me grow in so many ways and um um yeah that's my story well and and did you because i i rem- i didn't play football because i was uh not tall and even skinnier and yeah. i was fast but um if they caught me i would have been a dead <laughs> yeah so um <clears throat> but i played soccer and many of as you're telling your story same type of thing. I played all four years of high school and was going to play in college, but many times wanted to quit and, and <clears throat> saw several people actually quit. And did you see, because when you talked about grit, did you see people who were more talented? Yet get up? Oh, yeah. Th- that's what blew me away. Like, I'm just going to stick it out. Like, it felt like this is just a game of attrition. Yeah. That there's phenomenal people. We got this one kid from Canada. He came down. He's like six seven, and he, kid you not, the guy's like almost three hundred pounds. And he said he never lifted weights in his life. And he's putting up like three hundred twenty five bench press. And we're like, what's going on? The guy lasted three weeks. Couldn't handle it. And we're like, okay, this is another one. Just stick it out. Yeah. And now as teachers, when you have like those types of students in your class, I, I mean, I've said so often, it's like, give me, <clears throat> give me a class full of. Um, the, the kiddos who are uh, hard workers, yeah. maybe not maybe maybe not performing as well. I would rather have thirty two hard workers in the class than than thirty two Einsteins who aren't applying themselves. Mm-hmm. And and I think from the coaches, they want the same thing. I mean, you hear these stories all the time. Of the the coaches love. I mean, Rudy, the movie. I mean, the movie Rudy. Oh yeah. Is like the perfect example. It makes me cry every time. But mm-hmm. he he didn't have the most talent. I mean, what you're five five nothing, a hundred nothing. Yeah. But but look what he did. Yeah, and so yeah, I, I love that that idea of that. It's not talent, and I love what uh, Duckworth mentions in her book that it's it's a, this blend. And who and it's hard to say how much it is, but it's it's passion and persistence. Yeah, 
just sticking stick. And I remember my coach in college used to use this word and we used to mock him all the time. Like, this is not a word, but he called it stick to I'm like, no, that's like four or five words. That's not a word. He's like, we just kept, he just kept pushing this idea of stick to Just stick to it. We're going to outwork people. You're going to outwork people. And you know what? That just, it just, it changes your DNA a little bit. Yeah. And I find, and I find myself now in projects that you're in, Hey, you got to do this. You got to do this lesson. You got to roll out this stinking Google suite or whatever. You're like, I'm just going to stick with it. I'm just going to stick with it. And just trying to be able to, um, uh, put the work in because I think by putting the work in and, 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 and the thing that resonates me most is when she's saying that people who think about things all the time. And sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm almost too connected, not like digitally connected, but like I'm going to bed reading and I'm going to bed thinking. And then I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking, and I'm like, sometimes I don't know if this is the best thing is that I'm really pretty driven in terms of if I think about my professional world all the time. And I need yeah. to try to be able to create opportunities not to. So for me, that's kind of going out to my garden a little bit. And I'm not, I do it as a former athlete. I'm, to be honest with you, I'm doing a horrible job taking care of myself uh, physically. Like I should be doing something. Like I got to, hey, I'm, I'm podcasting. I'm looking at a beautiful elliptical machine that I don't get on. <laughs> and I feel like I need to a little bit. I probably need to balance a little bit more. But I think we're all kind of in that, right? Those of us who are a little bit uh, suckers for this oh, drive, I guess. It's it's that, that constant desire to improve and, and to learn and, and to be a life. I mean, we hear, oh, I'm a lifelong learner. I want to be a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we do have to balance that with exercise. And I'm with you. I, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm not looking at an elliptical machine. <laughs> and, and, and if I was, I probably wouldn't be on it, which yeah. I should be. But yeah. um, well, but also, as you're telling that story about the grit and, and Angela Duckworth's Talking about that, I mean, it reminds me of Carol Dweck's work with with the growth mindset and how I mean how you can get when you persevere, when you do that, when you show that stick to itiveness and you don't give up, you create more connections in the brain. And you actually get smarter. I mean, it's 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 crazy, and I've seen that. <clears throat> excuse me i I've, I've seen that in my own family. I've seen that with my daughter who is, you and I were talking before we started recording, she's a junior in high school, and she is, I'm going to brag on my brag on my baby girl, who is now nearly as tall as me, hmm. but uh, she's got like a 4.3 GPA. She's She is just an amazing student. She's so motivated. But what I, what I admire about her probably more than anything is her grit and her perseverance. And in, in middle school, she, she is a, phenomenal reader and a phenomenal writer that is that's her thing that's what she wants to do math it's not her passion <laughs> yeah she, she does well but it, 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 it's if she had her choice that wouldn't be what she did and in middle school starting in sixth grade I mean she she had a hard time because the math I mean you remember I mean you it gets harder <laughs> oh, gotcha. grade, and then seventh grade and eighth grade and 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 every year I mean sixth grade it, it was a struggle and then seventh grade, it got a little easier. And eighth grade, it got a little easier. And and the interesting thing about that is it was getting easier, almost inverse, inversely proportional to the difficulty of the material getting harder. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because she she didn't give up. And she, she stuck with it. She stuck with it. She stuck with it. Okay, so, so let me interrupt and ask you a question then. So what can you do as a father or an educator, if it's your child or if it's the kids in your classroom or the kids under your leadership as a principal, how do you put something in place that helps that? Because is it just that a circumstance? Was it a, was it a, the, the roll of the dice, luck, or whatever? Like how can we, what role can we do? Because I think we are just driven so much. We are just driven by not just, just testing, but curriculum drives so much of what we're doing. Yeah. And I feel like, and I'm, and I'm in here too. I'm teaching, I, I got thrown into an elective class. I'm like, I'm going to do things crazy and wild. And you guess what I'm finding myself? I'm, dr I'm driven by the curriculum that I'm making up. And I'm like, how do I, how do I get out of it? So let me ask, is there a recipe to be able to create those experiences for these, these I, I think kids? One of the first thing that I found with 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 my daughter and with with students when I was in the classroom, I'm now an administrator, but it's it's dispelling that that mindset that I'm not a math person. Uh, because I think I mean you I, I pretty much guarantee you've heard someone say that. Probably right. 
probably adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not a math, I'm not a math guy. I'm not a math girl. Where I think number one is as a, as a dad, it's kind of like you can't say that. Because while you may not, it may not be your favorite thing to do, you can be. Or And I find myself fighting that as well. Like, I, I'm a podcaster. I love tech. That I am not a handyman. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, we, we're, we're birds of a feather right there. Yeah. My, 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 my wife did not marry me for uh, the, 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 the home improvements that I'm going to do to our physical mm -hmm. mode. Uh, that, that's I, I was in Home Depot today, and I feel like someone's going to kick me out because I don't belong here. <laughs> but um, I, I just <clears throat> getting rid of getting rid of that. I'm not a math guy because I think that's something that she would have told. Well, I'm not a math girl. Math's not math's not my thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so if we can change the mindset of people to realize that, that that that's a great that's a great one. I'm thinking that the, can there be, and I'm not. You know, I hear about it all the time, but I think the project-based stuff is a wonderful opportunity to create the, the, the those those chances to say, hey, listen, this may not be your passion, but can I create some systems in this class or at my school to be able to put you in this place, to give you time and some choice and to be able to do something? And I think that th th I think we're on the right road with the pro project-based learning stuff to be able to help put some systems in place. But I don't know, I don't know where uh, where else to do this. And I'm thinking... I want. I feel like a, a student teacher. Like this was my first year, and I did not do very well at it. What can I do next year to be able to help some of these kids develop all of this? Because they're not. I, mean, I taught AP history for fifteen years, and I felt like I, I think I did a decent job, but I was stuck in the on on that wheel. And I felt once I'm out of there, I'm like, my God, I think I did a disservice to these kids because just teach them about stupid trade routes in Africa and you know Mongol expansion. I'm like, why? What, we, we got stuck in all of this. But every time that we would do a divergent, we'd go off and do some project here, a project there, that would resonate with kids. And I'm wondering like, man, how, how can we create those opportunities in all of our classes? Yeah, and I think as you were saying that, retakes, redos, I think as, as teachers too, and I was guilty of it, of the and I think in high school now and you've got a daughter in high school as well and I don't know if you've experienced this but unfortunately many times it's it's all about the grade oh it's all about the grade yeah all, it, which it drives it, everything oh and it just it kills me but but going back to math it's it's like I think going back to your earlier question like what can we do as parents what can we do as teachers to do this I think as teachers make it less about the grade and more about the learning and, and what that would mean, for example, in a math class is if they don't get it the first time, don't give them the death penalty for that and say, well, sorry, you got a 53 on that test. So that's what's going in the book. Uh, stinks to be you. It, it, I mean, because that's that's not what we're doing. It's like, oh, you didn't get it here. Here's what you missed. Let's go back and try it again. Because is it? we, we, we can't penalize kids. I remember Rick DeFore going to a, a PLC. Oh, yeah, the DeFore, yeah. Yes. I was and, there. and him saying, this is probably the biggest thing that resonated with me is, because I was guilty of it sometimes, was penalizing students for not learning it the first time. Oh, yeah. And and, and, and you're, you're stifling grit. <laughs> if if mm -hmm. students know, well, it's it's now or never. How, how can we build that perseverance in them, that build that grit in them if, if we're not even giving them second, third, fourth, 17th chances if that's what they need? Yeah, so interesting. So uh, the school that I teach at was started in 1993, and the principal who started the school, I got there in, in 2000, and the school was built on the mastery model in which that we don't give Ds and Fs, and we still don't. Mm -hmm. Our school is A, B, C, and then a no mark. So everything, usually it's like a 70%, but we said that we're not going to be able to say that you know, kids are failing that if we are going to hold everybody and say, you got to reach a mastery learning and time does not dictate that. So time could be flexible. And so this was this wonderful idea. But what interesting is that now we had to fit your curriculum and college scores and ABCs and all that kind of stuff. And then also the realization, well, that we knew you have to move on at some point. And the school was built like you literally could have f fixed freshman English your senior year. And it, it, the theory of it was wonderful, but the logistics of trying to be able to manage a, a, a school that way was a challenge. So since 93 to today, we are still almost in every staff meeting, still having conversations about how we can do this mastery learning in the real world, in, in, yeah. in being able to 
churn kids through and and holding them accountable. And what's wonderful about it is our school, we have many of those same core group of teachers and we are still like, we're in our forties and fifties and sixties. And we're still like having these theoretical conversations about how to be able to do this. And, there, and, and in the end, the answer is kind of feels like, like we're talking to Yoda. Like there is no answer. The answer is the journey that we're on to try to be able to find this. But in the fact, the fact that you're having those conversations, I mean, I, I'm, that's, that's the first, second, third, and fourth step. I mean, you guys mm -hmm. are having those conversations and not uh, sitting and saying, well, I've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. And it was interesting. Uh, it was about two. It was uh, it was this last one, maybe the last one, the one before. Uh, the, we had an uh, ed tech team came, comes out and does a Google Summit. And we had Jeff Heil come out, and he was doing the uh, keynote. And he and he brought up mastery learning. And a bunch of us with the school were like, we don't hear mastery learning very much. Like, great. Like, maybe this is coming back again. And so we, we had Jeff actually come out to uh, to our school and give us a, a, give us a little bit of a uh, – you know, a booster shot of uh, keep thinking about mastery learning. And, and for any interest in, there's a lot of research out there on the mastery learning, but it is a, uh, it's, um, I, I think it ties in that idea of grit of trying to be able to uh, build that, but it's still, I mean, there's still a lot of struggles. I mean, that's, uh, that's the world of education. There's no solution. No. And yeah, and unfortunately, solution. Think, easy solution. I mean, getting into colleges is all about SATs and mm -hmm. grades and stuff like that. So high schools play the game <laughs> because, yeah. If they don't, they, their their kids aren't going to get into college, and or which it's just like it's a vicious cycle. But I just think, I mean, for anyone listening, I mean, hope hopefully you get. I, I'm getting something out of this, so. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. it's, funny, it's funny you mentioned about like grades and it takes me back maybe i've been thinking this whole my whole life like i hated grades like my mother and i kid you not i love my mom but she sends she puts sends in the mail my report cards to my children so i get my high school like hey something from your mom came in oh jeez, my junior year report card thanks mom and she's like send it to my kids and I'm like Dad, look at the d and french one like yeah i got it it was yeah i passed what? And I just, I just think the lesson that I'm taking from this as we're talking about this is we have to, if we want to build grit, we have to give kids opportunities to build grit. And if they don't get it the first time, I mean, keep creating more opportunities, I guess, creating more opportunities to get it and, and, and don't beat them over the head with a red pen 53 on the test. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I'm thinking Rita Pearson right now with her Ted talk, every kid needs a oh, yeah. When when she talks about the kid who who on a twenty question quiz wrote plus two, which because minus eighteen sucks the life <laughs> out of you, but plus two says I ain't all bad. Yeah, <laughs> and and I just think the perse I mean, perseverance, grit it's it is so important. And I'm an elementary principal, so we're starting with five year olds, and and this is part of our vocabulary. It's part of what we talk about all the time. But it can't. It can't just be what we say. It ha we have to give the kids opportunity to build that. Excellent. Here, hey, here's a big question for you, elementary guy to a high school guy. Why, why do they lose their love for school? I have kids and they hate coming every single day. I have an eighth grader and she loves school and now she's an eighth and she's like, oh, I don't want to go to school. I'm like, what happened? The fun's gone because I have a seventh grader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I and I think that I think that that every year that they get older, it gets less fun. And I think a big a big reason for that, it 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 so much of the focus is more on grades. Yeah. And it's all it's a it's 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 what here's the game that I have to play. What do I have to do? To I mean I, I've joked about it that that uh, she's not as much bad about it now. But my daughter's favorite app. I mean while now it may be Snapchat. It used to be her her Aries gradebook portal. Oh my god! Just, oh my yeah. God. Oh, that just that it's just terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> what what is? I did but, not think you were going to say that Aries gradebook portal. <laughs> because because nothing because, against the fine folks at Aries. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's not a no slide on Aries. So I mean, but but is that is that what our kids should be? Uh, they yeah. shouldn't be focused on. I've got a ninety something in the class. It's it's, and and I used to. I mean, my daughter is driving now. So, but when I used to take her to school, it, so when I would say, "Hey, how was school today?" or "or how was school?" it would be so often. It would be, "Hey, I got a this on the test. 
I got a 94 on my math test. I got a this. And I remember one day asking her, are you learning? I just, I, I kind of chuckled to myself and just said, are you learning? Because the answer so often is how school, well, school's going well because I got a good grade. And I think, gosh, that's, that's, so hard. that's dangerous. Yeah. It, 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 school shouldn't be, school should be going well only because I'm getting a good grade. School, I mean, we, school, it's, it can still be fun in high school. It can still be fun in middle school. You can still make those project-based learning activities and, and things like that. And if the learning's happening, the grades will come. And I think so often. What happens when they don't? And that's the hard thing because we are driven by the grades. And I, I forget, where did I hear this recently? Dang it. That there is no research but that says the A, B, C, D, F it has any sort of, it doesn't work. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I never really thought about it that way. But we are driven and it's not, and it's us and it's our kids and it's their kids are all going to be caught up in the same system. Yeah. I had a kid, no, it's, it, I had a kid in AP and she had struggled, 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 and she wanted to pass the test because we, we have this magical number of 70, but she's taking AP as a 15 year old. And I'm like, Hey, listen, if you get a 60%, that's, that's pretty good compared to the rest of the country. And that's going to do a good job in the AP score. And she's getting high fifties and she comes and she in practice. I work with her and she came in and she was absent the day the test came back and she came in after school and she says, I come on to see what I got. I'm like, and I looked at it. I'm like, Oh, she didn't pass. She got a 64. It's her highest yet. And I, and, I, and I show her the 64 and she just held it together. But I could see just cr falling apart inside. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, hey, you know what? Hey, this is your best one yet. And I'm trying to do the pep talk and like that. And compared to everybody and she didn't want to hear any of that. And she walked outside my door and she didn't realize that there's a bank of windows and her friends were waiting for her. And she oh. just collapsed in just tears and they walked away. And I just felt so bad. I'm like, I I don't know if what I'm doing is the right thing. Yeah. And well, so, and, and and wow, yeah. I, I, and I just think, and again, it is th these AP exams that that the colleges. I mean, there's the rules that that we play by. But I think as a teacher, what you what resonated with me about what you were saying is you were encouraging her. Hey, sixty's good. Oh, this is your best yet. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're you're improving. You're getting better. You're yeah. getting better. But yeah. And so in the end, it's, yeah, the hard part is, I know we went deep on all this stuff, but yeah, I mean, it's little answers here or there. Project-based learning is the answer. Mastery learning, it's 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 systemic, it's system changes need to happen. And I think the biggest thing, we can't create those, but we can just continue to keep striving and questioning as us as educators. And that's, I think, absolutely. If we if we live in the, if we live in the past, if we live in the status quo, mm -hmm. nothing's going to get better. I think having those conversations in staff meetings and PLCs on Twitter, on Voxer, in podcasts like this um wanting to improve if you want to keep improving your your day-to-day -day instruction then then we're gonna win and it's a lot we're in a marathon but so yeah. it's that shawshank tunnel that we're in <laughs> it feels like that sometimes <laughs> yeah. but, but but freedom is on the other end it, it is it's worth it for the kids but yeah well Gosh, Ryan, this is awesome conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time, man. Brent, I really appreciate it, and, 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 I, and I love the, that you gave me the opportunity to have this. Uh, no, I, 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 like I said, I got something out of it. I, I think anyone listening is going to get something out of it, too. And for those listening, if they want to connect, as we talked about at the top of the show, if they want to connect with you online, how would they do that? It's one word, creative ed tech. It's my Twitter handle. It's a website that I put a bunch of stuff. I got lots of resources on there, you know, that feel free to be able to check out. So creative ed tech, creative ed tech. And like I said, I got uh, the Check This Out podcast. And I also got another podcast I have a lot of fun doing with social, social studies teachers called Talking Social Studies. And uh, same sort of thing. Just a bunch of people who get together and have conversations. And um, awesome. that's how you can find me. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Again, folks, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, I haven't listened to the social studies one yet, but that was my favorite subject teaching. No. So I, I need to check that check out. That. <laughs> so, and uh, for anybody listening, as we, uh, as we say each time, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. Google Play, iTunes, in Spotify now as well. And as I heard you and Brian say this last night, uh, Ryan, if you like what you hear, drop a review in there because again, that's not about ooh, the ego or anything like that. It helps other people find the podcast. Yeah. Uh, if it's, if it's reviewed well, it, it, it moves up and, and people can see it more. So that's, that's why we ask for that. It's not mm -hmm. about, uh, 
adulation or anything like that. So, and and for those of you listening, I mean, just I have one last plug, and that's for all of us, and that's called this thing that a, a bunch of us are doing, which is called the the podcast edu community. And there's nothing official, but if you find something that you listen to that you that you loved it, share out with hashtag podcast edu. If you're making a podcast, hashtag podcast edu. If you're learning, if you think kids are learning. If anything revolving around education, we'd like that to be, we're trying to be able to make this as the place that we all kind of can share out. Awesome. Yep, absolutely. So Ryan, once again, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. And for everybody listening, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And until next time, have a good one.